Good evening or good morning. Good afternoon and good night. Um, we do have a very expansive audience today with attendees spread across all time zones and it's my very great pleasure to welcome you all to this webinar. My name is <clears throat> Meg Samuelson and I'm delighted to be opening our conversation with Ashil Mbembe, one of the most profound and exhilarating thinkers of our times in all their heterogeneities and entanglements. Ashil Mbembe is research professor at the Witts Institute for Social and Economic Research in Johannesburg, which is one of the great hubs of critical theory in the South under the directorship of Sarah Nuttall. And he has also held permanent and visiting positions across the continent, the United States and Europe. He has authored a series of groundbreaking studies, including the books translated as On the Post Colony, Critique of Black Reason, Necropolitics, and Out of the Dark Night, and most recently, but not yet available in English, the book Brutalism, and a report presented to French President Emmanuel Macron earlier this month, in which he lays out the terms for a refoundation of the Africa-France relation. Also published this year is the essay Futures of Life and Futures of Reason, which was the topic of his 2020 presidential lecture in the humanities at Stanford University. His 2018 tenor lectures on human values at Yale in, engaged inter alia with the idea of a borderless world, an idea for which we might need to work a bit harder now following the events of the past two years. Before we begin, let me introduce myself as being based at the University of Adelaide in South Australia. I speak from Ghana country and on lands that were never ceded and I pay respects to Ghana elders and to all other custodians of what are the oldest continuous living cultures in the world across this archipelagic nation. Professor Mbembe in turn joins us from the continent that is, as he's recently reminded us, the cradle of humanity. It's to these venerable southern worlds that we might look as we seek to navigate times of brutalism and catastrophe without, of course, smoothing over the significantly different ways in which they are positioned in this time. This conversation is co-hosted co by a research group called Stories from the South in the School of Humanities at Uni Adelaide. The conference Situations of Theory convened by Stephen Newkey and Julian Murphy, the Department of English Creative Writing and Film at Adelaide and the English Department of, of Stellenbosch University. Together, we are interested in the situations that occasion theory, in the situatedness of theory, in thinking from the South and across different styles, and in questions relating to the genres and styles of thought. Some of these preoccupations may weave into our conversation. The modus operandi is that we'll start with a preliminary set of questions which are addressed to Professor Mbembe, engaging certain interventions in his oeuvre, and after about 20, 25 minutes, we'll open to the audience for further questions and comments. We'll invite questions through two pathways. Please use the raised hand function to indicate that you'd like to be invited to unmute yourself, ideally show your video and present your question live in person. Or if you prefer to type your question to be read out on your behalf, please do so using the Q&A function. I remind you to please try to keep questions focused. And I invite you to briefly introduce yourself by name and affiliation or location before posting them. My thanks to Julian Murphy and Stephen Mewkey, um, the conveners of the conference situation and sort of theory, who will be helping and fielding questions both in the conference venue and on screen. To Rachel Cairns for technical assistance, to Sam Cox for poster design, and to the School of Humanities and the head of school, Natalie Edwards, for supporting this event. Ashil, thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to, to be here. There is a tradition of thought in which Africa is cast out of the currents of world history and conceived as being of intellectual interest only to area specialists and exoticists, um, a place consigned to, in the words of the Commonwealth, performing its otherness. Your provocation, in contrast, has been to think the world from Africa. 
and what you have demonstrated profoundly and consistently is that an inquiry into Africa is an interrogation of the world. Before we turn to that interrogation, could you comment a bit on the geopolitics of knowledge today and the need to compose what you've called a planetary library? Okay. Um, as you see, um, I, I, my primary location is, is the African continent. Uh, I live in, in Johannesburg in South Africa. And uh, it is from the continent that um, I, I try to make sense of uh, uh, the world we, we all share. Uh, which, which in fact we we um, which is the only one known to to harbor uh, life and uh, which as we all know is in need of uh, of repair uh, because uh, it has been severely damaged by um, our uh, activities. And I understand like many others that sharing it as equitably as, as possible is, is the very condition for, for its durability and, and ours and that of uh, other, other species. Now, we know very well the status Africa as a, as a place and as an idea have occupied in hegemonic uh, modes of, of thought and, and styles of, of thinking as you 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 said. Um, of these hegemonic uh, modes of thinking, Western thought, to put it broadly, has occupied a key uh, position. And uh, Western discourse uh, has defined itself indeed as the discourse of, of reason. But, but when it comes to, to Africa, um, Western discourse, here again, to speak in, in broad generalities, uh, has been found to be a discourse that is very often lacking in reason, although it defines itself as uh, the discourse of, of reason. And, and one would imagine that um, all that is needed to, to rectify this unreason, this ignorance, is knowledge. And yet, uh, even knowledge itself has not been able to, to save uh, this discourse from its propensity to, to ignorance and unreasonability, if we may use such, such a term. So, um, it seems to me that the geopolitics of what do you call the geopolitics of knowledge or what Walter Mignolo has, has labeled as such um, is grounded as far as we are concerned um, in, in this original uh, matrix I wouldn't call it original sin, uh, although we, we, <laughs> we might uh, analogically, uh, uh, let's see, uh, refer to that. Um, it's uh, geopolitics of knowledge, which has been premised on a kind of desire for, for diff difference. Um, 
in the sense that where it has applied, uh, I'm still speaking from Africa, uh, reason has been often to, to, to discover uh, itself in its, uh, in its uh, di differences. Uh, Africa being uh, the, the field of manifestation uh, of this difference uh, par, par, par excellence. Um, the other uh, element of this geopolitics has been uh, its uh, racial nature uh, in the sense that uh, the, the tribunal of reason has been delimited as uh, a racial uh, jurisdiction, uh, the identity of which uh, often appears uh, to be a thinking of, of race as, uh, as the condition for, for thinking anything at all. Um, so, <clears throat> From that point of view, um, the question many of us have been uh, dealing with has been pretty simple. Uh, if the history of uh, West, Western discourse is, is to a large extent a history of unreason, to what extent can we then argue that, uh, in fact, uh, uh, um, Africa has been that which always exceeds it? How do we uh, account for that capacity of excess? And, and how, starting from here, we might say something uh, about uh, our world and uh, our modes of existence at large uh, that has been the, the project. And, and, and therefore, uh, transcending difference, transcending the racial, uh, and finding new modes of inhabiting the earth at large, that is what uh, uh, the whole uh, uh, question of the planetary, uh, let's say, uh, um, suggests. It's really striking to me that you know, two definitions that you give of the decolonial project are the will to community and the disenclosure of the world. Because so much, or particularly um, post-colonial thought has revolved around the politics of difference and identity. And you seem to be you know, marking a different path. Um, Towards communities, do you, I mean? Do you think that the politics of identity and difference how, has run its course, or do you think it's led us into a certain cul-de-sac, um, into a, into a cul-de-sac perhaps of that unreason that you've been um, talking about? See, my take on the question of difference and identity has been very um, much influenced by, by my reading of Fanon, Franz Fanon, uh, um, and to some extent, uh, Glissant. Of course, there, there, there was a time when the politics of, of identity um, was was necessary, and one can imagine that in a number of instances, this is still the case. It was necessary, for instance, during the, uh, the age for uh, what concerns us, the age of, of the Negritude movement. It was necessary because of the uh, prior definition of, of the African, whatever that means, as uh, 
something that pertained, at least in Western philosophical discourse, to the realm of uh, ontic destitution, whether uh, this destitution was then followed by subjugation or not, where the African uh, was akin to um, natal alienation, um, to something that was so different as to be an assimilable, at least in, in, in the, uh, the discourse of reason. So this uh, element of uh, dehumanization that was so central to a definition that was not simply theoretical, but uh, in colonial context or in slave context, it was material, it was bodily, uh, it was uh, uh, a dispositive uh, that uh, uh, permanently tried to keep uh, people uh, down, there was a necessity to articulate a discourse on the self uh, that would rehabilitate uh, the human in us. And the ground for such a discourse was, of course, that which we had uh, uh, created uh, ourselves. So for instance, in the discourse of the negritude in someone like Senghor, there is a celebration, uh, even a racial celebration of uh, those peculiarities and that uh, uh, singular genius. The, um, but even in the discourse of the negritude, difference was always called upon to be transcended because even Senghor himself, uh, He's not celebrating difference for its own sake. Difference is for him um, that which um, we have to put in common, if you want. Um, that which is to be shared because what matters, including in Senghor's, uh, uh, let's say, vision of, of the world, what matters is the, the coming together of, uh, of uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, everything, the, the whole world, uh, it's a glissant uh, concept. So that idea of the whole world, le tout monde, uh, has been absolutely key to, uh, let's say, a black uh, radical uh, critique, that tradition in any case. And no one else epitomizes it as, as Franz Fanon, for whom uh, the um, ultimate aspiration of the oppressed is to be recognized as, as a human like any other human. That originary radical similarity or proximity, which forms the basis of uh, any uh, uh, theory of emancipation. So, so that's where uh, some of us, that's our genealogy. Uh, but as we, we see uh, nowadays, I mean, the politics of identity and, uh, and difference, I think uh, has, has led us to some extent into a cul-de-sac, into an impasse. Uh, and this impasse is all the more um, regrettable because uh, the overall condition we find ourselves in today is one in which the planet is becoming smaller and smaller. And uh, let me just put it succinctly uh, to the politics of difference. I prefer, um, let's say, a, a new a new planetary consciousness. I think that's where the key uh, challenges 
of the now and of tomorrow, that's where they lie. And so the planetary library would be a set of resources that would help us to nurture and nourish this planetary consciousness. Is, 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 that, is that right? The planetary library would you know, draw from um, the all areas of the of the world, all areas of the human and non-human world to help us to learn to nourish the planetary consciousness. Is that how you conceive of this expensive library, which I take to be a sort of a, a, a metaphor for, for the archive, for the university, for the world of thought that is available to us. Yes, I mean, I think of it in at least in two terms. Uh, on the one hand, um, I would like to take seriously the, the materiality of the planetary. And the planetary is not only the uh, the um, the biophysical, the uh, the organic uh, mineral world we 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 live in, we are a particle, small one, in fact, of. Um, is not only the uh, the global collective of of the humanity. Uh, it is it is the living world. Uh, I don't know whether that's. The English translation of, of the French term le vivant is, is, is the living world in its, uh, I would say, in its, in its multiplicity. Um, as uh, this living world uh, undergoes um, its endless process of, of transformation, uh, a transformation which has no omega point. Uh, which is not, as, as far as I'm concerned, uh, not supposed to, to reach an apex or, or, or a, uni, a moment of, of unification. Uh, uh, so, so in that sense, the, the planetary uh, includes, let's just say all uh, creation, the, the whole world, all the people of the world, the uh, artificial, uh, creations or, or works of, of humanity, the, the mass of things uh, humanity has invented, uh, in addition to, of course, animals, to, to plants, to, to minerals, all, all mixed bodies, which we all are in any case, each of us. And uh, uh, so I take seriously that uh, uh, whole physical universe uh, the spiritual and the uh, the biological energies, which are are, are consistent uh, with the definition of of the living world. Uh, this has nothing to do with universalism, uh, in the old sense in which this term was was understood. Um, but it seems to me that uh, uh, this idea of the living world uh, could form. Uh, the basis for a new concept of uh, the in common. Uh, and uh, in that sense, uh, the earth, this earth, uh, which is uh, our, how to put it, our shared roof and our shared shelter, uh, in any case, sharing these, this roof and shelter uh, as equitable as possible is, I think, the condition of sustainability of life on earth. If that is the case, then uh, questions of truth and questions of knowledge have to be entirely reconfigured. I find it absolutely tragic for any young student, whether living in Australia or in Canada, or, 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 or in China to go through a university uh, curriculum, for instance, without ever having read a novel from Africa or from Latin America. Uh, building knowledge for the future on the basis of a very reduced notion of the archive, 
what we inherit is uh, the archives of the entire world, of the whole world. And, and therefore, uh, what I'm arguing for goes beyond, let's say, ideas of proven, provincialization, uh, as in any case, uh, uh, developed, uh, let's say, in the, uh, in the mid 90s. It's not about provincializing any, any part of the world. It's, it's, it's bringing together uh, all the archives that we have inherited from uh, different regions of, of the earth and from the, the earth itself and uh, putting them at the disposal of, of everyone and sharing them as equitably as possible in order to meet the challenges of an earth that is uh, in full, full uh, uh, com com combustion. Uh, that's the term in French. I don't know how you translate it in English, uh, but it's, it's warming up uh, and, and, and moving towards uh, 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 ex extremities. Can I, before I turn open to the audience, can I ask you to talk to your concept of um, borderization, perhaps in relation to your concept of, ne of the necropolitical, um, as you know, among the structures and, 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 and techniques that, are, that you know, are interrupting this work and contributing to the laying waste of life. Okay, that's a, a rather a complex um, set of um, issues that um, might require a little bit of elaboration, but I, I promise I, I, I won't do it in, in any detail. So let The work I've been doing on, on borders uh, starts from, let's say two, two broad observations, or let's say three. Uh, first of all, um, the historical observation that in in most parts of uh, the continent of Africa, prior to uh, colonization, the, um, the, uh, the key um, philosophical uh, interrogation is not about being or ontology. As, uh, sorry to keep coming back to, to these generalizations, as opposed to, let's say, uh, the key interrogations in Western philosophy, where the question of being is at the beginning and end of the philosophical uh, gesture. You read Heidegger, I mean, uh, Lettre et le Temps, uh, Sartre, they all come back at one point or the other to the question of ontology, of, of being. In African pre-colonial systems of thought, the key question is that of relation and the question of relation itself is always connected to that of movement or mobility, capacity to move. The capacity to relate is the same thing as the capacity to be in motion. Which means that 
in our conceptions of the world, movement precedes space. Space and relations are constituted through movement, through motion, through mobility. And everything else is organized around that driving force which motion is all about. And with the advent of colonialism, that key logic of uh, human organization and also of thought was, uh, let's see, uh, we, we moved into an entirely uh, different paradigm. And with the advent of modernity, A key uh, thing has been that people of African descent, Africans or people of African descent, um, have found it very difficult to move freely. Forced mobility has become constitutive of our history. And decolonization didn't bring this to an end. Africa is still saddled with multiple borders from within, and it's becoming more and more difficult for many uh, to, to move uh, around uh, the world. And techniques of control of movement have become uh, extremely uh, miniaturized to the point where bodies themselves have become portable borders. And the racialization of, uh, uh, let's see, the resources of, of mobility. This is what has led me to reflect on the possibility of a borderless world. And um, this work, uh, we're pursuing it um, as we speak at Wiser, the institute where I work, with a major project on, on which is called Regions 2050, where um, this question of mobility is once again at the core of a whole series of research uh, in, in major parts of the continent in a context of the transnationalization of uh, the continent itself um, and uh, the um, uh, big uh, impact, let's say, technological uh, innovations are, are having on, on our imagination of our place in the world. So it's some, something of that kind. Terrific. Uh, thank you very much, Ashil. We have a, a question from Brazil, which I'll try and um, incorporate in a larger question. Um, this is about the African diaspora, and particularly uh, the imposition of the catastrophe of slavery and the forced movement of, of African people to North and South America and the Caribbean, and the the degree to which contemporary North and South American society are still living with the legacy of that genocide, of the, the, the necropolitical um, carnage um, that is still defining the political structures of uh, existence in the new world. So just perhaps to get a comment on, on that. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, 
it seems to me that the there is a of course um, it, it it's a fact uh, that has elicited uh, a number of uh, debates uh, which are still uh, unfolding most of which are driven uh, by not the Brazilian experience, but the, uh, the, um, the US uh, experience. Um, and yet, as we know, there have been at least uh, three matri matrices of uh, racial uh, necropolitics in, in in the modern world. The US has been one of them uh, with uh, racial slavery and racial capitalism from uh, the 15th century onwards. The Caribbean uh, and Brazil have been the other matrix and the third one has been South Africa. Of which um, Hannah Arendt in particular, uh, building on the works of uh, a South African historian called the Kivit uh, wrote about. And, and these uh, reflections, um, are developed in, in chapter two of her origins of totalitarianism. In a ch chapter is called Race and Bureaucracy, where, where in fact, uh, she, she makes some interesting comparisons between uh, South Africa, uh, settler colonialism in South Africa and uh, uh, settler colonialism in Australia for that matter. Brazil has hardly figured in these conversations and is still to figure in them uh, today. They are dominated by the US paradigm in the form of what is known as uh, Afro-pessimism. Afro-pessimism building uh, partly on the work of sociologist Orlando Patterson, uh, who uh, defined uh, racial forms of the necropolitical uh, in, in, uh, in terms of social death. Of, on the one hand, natal alienation, of which I've been speaking about early on in response to Meg's question, natal alienation as a form of ontic destitution, uh, which is uh, uh, transmitted from generation to generation. It's a, a bit like the, the original sin. Uh, there's no way in which you can escape it. It's there uh, uh, before one is even born. And one carries it, and not even death itself brings it to an end. And that's what he calls natal alienation. So natal alienation on the one hand and social death on the other. He doesn't expand that much on the social death part of uh, the necropolitical compact or contract, uh, if, if you want. Uh, but uh, this uh, image or uh, image concept has been uh, picked up by, uh, in, in, in the, the language of Afro-pessimism, uh, and, and push to uh, its uh, ultimate consequences, which are what? Which are, have to do with uh, the fact uh, that the kind of uh, violence that um, black people under slavery and after slavery uh, are subjected to, um, 
is, is a violence that has no, not only has no justification, but um, it's a, a form of, of violence that uh, um, is, it has no foundation. Uh, no foundation in the sense that you cannot explain it. It has no rational explanation. Um, not only does it happen at random, um, but uh, in most instances, it fulfills no particular function. Uh, it cannot be understood from a purely utilitarian uh, paradigm. It, um, it has no meaning, nor does it have a material or economic function. Um, and um, it is a form of violence that uh, can, cannot be uh, resolved from within the strictures of uh, uh, either liberal or democratic norms. Um, it has the characteristics of a civil war and of uh, a racial war. And um, um, the uh, only way of uh, bringing it to an end is through uh, a kind of mimetic form of violence that uh, uh, reproduces uh, the originary uh, while uh, transcending it simultaneously. So it's uh, uh, not a form of violence that leads to any, uh, leaves room for any uh, idea of reconciliation. If you want to know more about this, just read the, the, the work of uh, uh, Wilderson or, or, or Sexton Jarrett. Uh, Afro-pessimism is, is uh, very present nowadays in, uh, in most campuses, uh, uh, especially in the US. And uh, we have seen um, the extent to which it is expanding uh, in places such as South Africa, I don't know that much about Brazil, but it's a particular reading of the US black experience. Now, if you want to account for, let's say the uh, uh, complexities of the Negro political contract, uh, we have to relate it to the different forms of not only slavery, but different forms of racism as they have developed historically in these three matrices I was talking about, the US, Caribbean and Brazil and South Africa. And we also have to relate it to uh, a proper understanding of contemporary forms of, of capitalism uh, and, and uh, especially uh, neoliberalism. It seems to me that a key driver uh, of uh, the process of, of planetarization uh, yesterday as today is indeed uh, capitalism uh, in the sense that we are, we are currently uh, not only ruled by, by the market, but, but that uh, the later has become uh, uh, our core moral experience. Uh, it has become so but so has become technology. And both the, the market and technology now uh, set uh, the rules and the procedures uh, according to which we, we are obliged to, to live uh, together uh, as a collective body uh, within uh, new, new planetary limits. And um, when we say the market and technology, uh, we are talking about calculation and calculability. 
and, and in so doing, uh, we are posing the problem of that which might escape calculation. Um, uh, and, and so the necropolitical uh, partakes in that sense in Brazil or elsewhere of uh, this idea that uh, everything and anything can be calculated. Uh, and to oppose it, we have to rehabilitate uh, concepts of incalculability uh, and, uh, 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 and, and therefore open up uh, uh, the possibility of, of, of thinking beyond, beyond what is calculable, uh, what is uh, codifiable uh, uh, and, and that which can be turned or not into, into an artifact. I'm sorry for the long response, but, but the question is, is too complex to, 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 to deal with in, in, in a short, short response, sorry. Thank you. I'd like to invite uh, Peter Mola to ask your question. Um, we will unmute you, thank you. Thank you so much, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, thank you, Professor, for your wonderful talk. My name is Apeke Molu, and I'm from the African um, History Project based in London. The question I want to ask is about dislocation. Um, I'm looking at, in the history of the interaction between the West and Africa, in the pathologies and aggressions of Western dislocation, um, the African has been dislocated from a lot of his um, possessions. So there's always been an appreciation for the African's land, the African's art, his mechanical output, his labor, but only when it's been dislocated from the African such that the West has appreciated these things and the uniqueness of these things to the African, but has not appreciated the African. And I fear now with um, you know, what, you've, what you've proposed is such a, a wonderful idea about the need to reinstall African knowledge into world knowledge. But I fear that soon that knowledge will also be dislocated because in the past we've spoken of the need to repatriate people. Now we are increasingly speaking about the need to repatriate material culture. Um, and I fear we'll one day need to speak about the need to repatriate African knowledge. So my question is this, does the Western Academy need to be more conscious in its decentering not only of Western knowledge, but of the Western philosopher. The African scholar is more oppressed than his knowledge, which others outside of the culture are able to explore and present in their own words. But there are very real structural difficulties to the African being able to do that. Thus, we have an increase in proliferation of African knowledge, but without a concomitant commitment to the African knowledge creator. How can we begin to ensure that the African follows his knowledge into these new spaces? Um, what are some of the structures or policies you think need to be put in place to ensure that we do not get a dislocation of this knowledge, which I think you've presented as being necessary for the really the survival of the planet, um, but that it won't be dislocated from us as Africans um, who created it in the way that our land and our labor and our material culture have been dislocated from us in the past. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, I, uh, I thank you for, for your, your question. Uh, and, and in fact, your, your own reflections because underlying your, your questions, definitely a, a set of uh, elaborations. I'm sure you didn't have the time to share entirely with us. Um, you see, um, let me put it this way. When, when we look at our history over a long uh, time span, let's say from, especially from uh, in, during the modern period, uh, 
from the 15th century on. Something really happened in the 15th century when uh, Europe, when we met uh, with Europe on a different, let's see, um, on di different terms. We had met Europe early on uh, at a time when um, the two regions of the world were more or less equal. In any case, the level of asymmetry was not as uh, important as it became uh, from the 15th century on. Uh, and, and it just kept uh, uh, that level of asymmetry only kept uh, uh, augmenting or increasing, uh, if you want. So something happened which spoke to some of the weaknesses within African societies themselves. And one of those major weaknesses, which was amplified with the slave trade <clears throat> and later on colonialism, one of those weaknesses <clears throat> has been and is still uh, our inability to keep for ourselves the best of what we have, the best of what we have created. A new situation in which the best of what we have, we tend, tends to be taken away from us, or we tend to not be able to create the conditions to keep it within the continent. And to keep it within the continent, not only in physical terms, but, but in, in, in very conceptual terms. So for instance, with the Atlantic slavery, slave trade, but also other forms of slave trade, um, which began even before the Atlantic one, the inability to keep the, uh, the strongest physically among ourselves, who is captured and sold to the Americas or sent beyond the Sahara or through the Indian Ocean, it's young people, it's uh, women in particular, those who can work, the labor force, and when I say the labor force, I'm not only referring to the muscular force, but also to uh, the knowledge that goes with it, the investments which go with it. We begin to, for instance, lose our objects. Today, as you mentioned, there's a talk about restitution and some of my friends are involved in that. Uh, Felwin has written a fantastic report on the question of restitution of African art objects. So it's not only the object that is taken away, it's the knowledge that goes with it. It's the rituals. When I say knowledge, knowledge for take a sculpture, is knowledge of the wood, knowledge of how to deal with plants, knowledge about how to deal with animals, botany, all of that. So it seems to me that at the heart of our problem, predicament, is that inability. Now, uh, when it comes then to um, current debates on, on, on restitution, uh, on reparation, that has to be taken into account, this, this, uh, this, this leakage, this ongoing leakage, uh, which has not finished. I mean, the, the money and the amount of money that leaves the continent every single year, the latest fi figures, uh, by UN institutions uh, 
speaks about minimum $80 billion every single year. So, so we have to stop the leakage. And when I say leakage, I mean it in its literal sense and in all the other senses. How do we stop the leakage? First of all, by abolishing the artificial borders that have turned the continent into a bunch of mini states that are totally meaningless when it comes to matters of world order. We stop the leakage by re-engineering the historical forces of mobility and circulation on the basis of which we built in the Middle Ages the empires of Songhai, of Mali, of Ghana. We built academic institutions like in Timbuktu. We developed forms of knowledge in which wealth in people and wealth in things were correlated. We built huge amounts of knowledge about how to take care of, of the earth, how to live in resonance with the universe at large, and how to communicate between different species by virtue of the same life we all have. All these key uh, concepts which are coming back, which were dismissed, for instance, during colonialism as animism, but which are now embraced and reactualized, including in new technological inventions, in the new relations the human is nowadays entertaining with the objects that have become our companions. So, so it seems to me that that uh, work has to be done. And um, uh, as uh, Meg was uh, signaling at the beginning of our conversation, uh, it has to be done with the goal of uh, reimagining uh, a new library that would be planetary. And in that sense, Western forms of knowledge are interesting to us. I'm not at all one who argues we should dismiss them. If there's one thing that is interesting in Western forms of knowledge, it's the way in which they have developed uh, capacity to for self-critique. In fact, the best critiques of Western forms of knowledge is Western knowledge itself. There are many other things that we can draw from there. So look, it's a very theoretical uh, response, but, but, but you see what, where, where I'm coming from and what I'm aiming at. At least I hope so. Great. Um, we're we're going to pass to Ben Etherington in a minute, but I have a question here from Kathleen Sampson, who is wanting to return you to the topic of Afro pessimism again and back to your book, Critique of Black Reason, where you talk about how we are, many humans on this planet, evolving toward um, becoming fungible objects, becoming superfluous humanity in. Um, turbocharged uh, techno-capitalism. Um, you say there, the durability of the world depends on our capacity to reanimate beings. And Kathleen's question is, does this mean halting this becoming black, turning it around through this reanimation, through planetary thinking, or is becoming black of the world a condition that can enable a consciousness of planetary entanglement? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's it. Uh, I mean, uh, look, the, the idea of the becoming black of the world, uh, for, for those of you who are not familiar with it, um, comes at the end, uh, I think, of the introduction to, to critique of black reason. <clears throat> um, it's um, a kind of summation of um, which, which is uh, which of a section uh, which um, let's see um, develop a set of comments on on uh, on contemporary forms of of capitalism. Uh, and its relationship with technology. Um, the, um, it's it's a, a term that has uh, um, created some, some controversy. Um, David Marriott, uh, who is an African American philosopher has written a whole article on it in in Radical Philosophy. Uh, it comes back uh, to to that uh, idea of the becoming black of the world, uh, uh, to and he criticizes it uh, uh, quite uh, pertinently. And um, the. Um, What, what can I say? Um, I'm, I, I'm not saying that everybody will become black. Uh, um, I am, um, looking in, into the, the ways in which um, robotics, um, artificial, uh, intelligence uh, um, advanced uh, automation uh, to be short uh, the ways in which all of, all of this um, is is turning a, a huge part of the laboring humanity um, into, into uh, superfluous uh, uh, beings. In any case, in regards to uh, the logics of uh, the shift in, in, in capital's architecture, both of production and of, of circulation, and, and, and therefore of, of, of value making, value measurement, uh, and so forth. Uh, and so on. Um, so uh, it's an argument uh, which goes somewhat along uh, the, the following lines. Um, automation uh, in all the senses of, of, of the, the word um, um, The advent of automation um, marks the, um, or, or can be characterized by the, uh, the, the primacy of, um, of virtualized transactions uh, over um, early forms of transactions. Um, which stressed the um, exploitation of, of people uh, and um, what we are witnessing or part of what we are witnessing is, is therefore a shift uh, of, of focus on, on new interdependencies between humans and machines. Um, and these new 
interdependencies between humans and machines, digitized machines, uh, seems to result increasingly in the e expulsion um, of uh, uh, many from the realm of production. So, so there is a new potentially conflictual relationship that is emerging between labor and automation and uh, the rise, uh, uh, this is propelled of course by the rise of a new breed of uh, uh, intelligent machines, uh, which uh, fundamentally threaten to, to, to remake the, uh, the structures, the conditions and the relations of everyday life, resulting, as I, I said in the, uh, of many uh, who would love to be exploited, but can no longer uh, uh, be exploited. And live in a place like Johannesburg uh, or in South Africa, levels of unemployment, uh, we are told are above 40%. So you have 40% of the population not would love to work in whatever uh, conditions. And he would love to be exploited, but there's no taker. So it's different from the time when, I mean, slaves had masters. Now, to put it in a simplistic way, we still have masters, but they don't need slaves any longer. Many would love to be slaves, but masters have found out that they don't need them any longer. So, so the becoming back of the world refers to that. It's not a racial term. It refers to, to the shifts, uh, which are uh, the result of uh, this process of uh, automation and uh, our increasing exposure to various wavefronts of calculability. And in, so there's once again, the question of that which cannot be calculated, uh, questions of the price of life, the way, how much does what life weighs? Uh, so, so look, it's, it, it's a clumsy explanation of uh, uh, an expression that has taken a life of, of itself. Ben, would you like to present your question? You need to unmute yourself. Can you hear me, Meg? Yes. Great. Uh, thank you very much for this terrific discussion, uh, Professor Mbembe. I have a question uh, that's ultimately going to lead to uh, politics, um, but it's uh, a comment of Césaire uh, that I'll start with. So when you were contrasting bad types of universalism to this uh, more planetary sensibility and the need for a sense of the in common, uh, and alongside those comments you made about sort of borders and negritude, I was thinking about the polemic of Césaire when he left the French Communist Party. Uh, and he talked about the emaciated universalism of the French Communist Party to which he contrasted his preference for a universal that is enriched by all that is particular, the deepening and coexistence of all particulars. I don't know. I'm sure you know that comment. I don't know if it's been translated well there. That comment to me, and maybe this is a fault of mine, doesn't seem so much to point to an in common but more the importance of existing and fighting for one's place and one's ecology and being able to flourish there. Flourishing there in the knowledge that others are also flourishing in their places and their ecologies. Um, now, I'd just be interested to know if you think that's a misinterpretation and whether there's a confluence between what Césaire is talking about when he talks about the deepening and coexistence of all particulars, but not necessarily the sharing of all those particulars um, but I'm asking this question ultimately 
because it leads to how people uh, organize themselves politically into groups and, and on what basis they fight. Because I interpret Suzanne's comment as being in line with the internationalism of that era of decolonization when there were a number of coordinated yet locally focused um, struggles. Uh, and I wonder, well, is what you're talking about a different kind of internationalism? Is it, is it we're in a different world now where we're fighting for the planet itself and we have a sense of fighting both for the human uh, and the non-human at once? Um, or is it something that I haven't really been able to get to in, in listening to your comments? Okay. Uh, very interesting. Um, Yes, uh, uh, Césaire uh, in particular, uh, but uh, Senghor too, although um, the, the differences of sensibilities here. Uh, I agree with your comment on, on Césaire's uh, um, take, uh, which as we know, uh, is uh, elaborated upon in his letter uh, of resignation from the French Communist Party, uh, his letter to Maurice Torres. Um, the, um, the, the element of sharing is less pronounced in Césaire than in, in Senghor. Uh, Senghor is the one who goes uh, uh, the farthest in articulating a political position beyond difference, which um, uh, draws particularly from the works of uh, Pierre Taylor de Chardin, uh, who was a, a, a French uh, thinker, uh, very uh, tuned to to pantheism, uh, to uh, the idea uh, that uh, the universe wa was, was one and uh, uh, it was inhabited by um, numerous particles which uh, were nevertheless all uh, uh, related uh, in, in one way or, or the other. So, so there is, a, let's say, a theory of, there's some a cosmological dimension of Senghor's work, which is, is probably uh, the result of his uh, having been exposed to, to Christianity. Uh, Césaire, as we know, was a, a communist and his own uh, relationship with, um, let's say, uh, the, uh, the forces of the universe uh, was uh, uh, less uh, theistic, uh, to put it uh, simply. Um, it, it, it was mediated through his, uh, his uh, um, uh, let's say, um, poetry in particular, uh, poetry which itself was, was, was influenced to some extent by, by um, surrealism. So, so we are dealing here with two, uh, uh, slightly different uh, traditions. Um, but both gave, um, provided a, a space for, for, for difference. But as I, I'm saying, uh, uh, Senghor went beyond difference. I mean, he was an, an apologist of métissage uh, uh, before, before Glissant, uh, uh, métissage including in its uh, uh, quote unquote racial dimension. That's what he's celebrating. He's celebrating uh, the, um, uh, the, the coming uh, in the future 
of a kind of ecumene uh, made up of all nations, uh, a plenum of, of nations uh, in, in a new form of universalism that would not be uh, a universalism of conquest, but a universalism of, of sharing. Uh, sharing of what? Sharing of what each uh, particular has as its uh, uh, genius, uh, its uh, originality. So, so, so for him, uh, the sharing of originality was the ultimate telos. Now, um, what I'm talking about takes that into into consideration. But uh, I also draw from a deep, deeper archive, deeper African archive, which precedes, uh, let's see, the colonial library. I don't know whether you are familiar with the work of a novelist called Amos Tutuola, from Nigeria, who wrote in the, uh, Meg will correct me, I think in the 50s uh, or uh, early, I think it was in the 50s. He, he wrote a, a novel which is called The Palm Wine Drinkard, which um, is a very interesting treatise of old Yoruba metaphysics, as speak about old Yoruba metaphysics, but in fact, these are uh, systems of thought one finds among the Dogon in Mali, uh, found in the Congo. It, it's quite peculiar to uh, most parts of, of the continent. And it is a mode of thinking which involves a positive and uh, I would add often risky uh, dynamics of, of exposure to, to the unknown and to the unforeseeable. Um, it is part of uh, uh, old African archives archives of, of old, which, which give pride of place um, uh, to, to the principle of animation. Uh, animation, but also uh, the sharing of the vital breath. And uh, these uh, archives of, of old, they uh, stand apart, I would argue, from uh, traditions which are convinced that uh, a, a fundamental difference exists between human subjects and the world around them, or, or between the human universe and, and the universe of nature, uh, of objects, uh, traditions which believe that uh, nothing uh, is inviolable, nothing is inalienable, uh, nothing is imprescriptible. Uh, uh, traditions which believe that everything is uh, an effect of, of power uh, and there's nothing worse than a disarmed power. So you have traditions like that, Promethean traditions of which uh, a philosopher like Nietzsche has spoken about at length, uh, Heidegger uh, also for, for that matter. And it seems to me that in our Anthropocene and techno-libertarian age, uh, a different existence is, is being sought. Uh, that, that other uh, vital structures, other paradigms of uh, liberation of the living, uh, let's say, are um, uh, 
more than necessary. So, so I'm not repeating just what St. God said. I'm building on the basis of these existing archives of old to articulate uh, uh, an idea of the in common that is encompassing, that was not there when Césaire and, and, and Senghor were writing, that is forced upon us but by these uh, 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 new age, new age, this, this moment, historical moment, when we, we suddenly realize that in fact, uh, humans, non-humans uh, are, are somewhat uh, uh, um, possessed by, by uh, the, the same kind of life that we, we, we have. So, so, so uh, it's the shift many are trying to, to make, uh, um, which takes us away from a mode of uh, existence dominated by, by fear, by anxiety, a search for, for safety, uh, the politics of, of identity and difference is exacerbated. Thank you. I'm going to move to close this session um, with grateful thanks to Professor Ndembe for his generosity in engaging with us here today. There are great demands in your time, I'm sure we're all aware of that, and we much appreciate having the opportunity to think with you over this hour and a half that you've um, given to us. My thanks also to this wonderful audience, to all of you who have zoomed in from around the world. We know that there are many more questions and sincere apologies that we weren't able to take them all in this session. I think that we've all benefited from the expansive nature of the answers. Um, and I think it's a, I think it's a hallmark of Mbembe's style of thinking, um, which to me has always been characterized by a certain openness to the world, perhaps a Tutiolian openness, um, a generosity of response and always a rigor of engagement. So thank you very much. And we hope that these questions um, will continue and we'll explore them in all of our work. Good evening. Good night to you. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thank you, Ashil. Thanks so much. Thank, thanks a lot. <laughs> no, it was really terrific. Hey, thanks, Julian. Uh, so we're happy that we recorded it because I, for one, am going to want to sit and listen properly through those answers again. Um, and there was a, a, a lot, a lot of the session. Really appreciate how much you got. Thanks for organizing it, Meg. It's not the first time, as I told you in the email, and uh, I'm very, very grateful. And thanks, Julian. Go away. Go you. away. Thanks again. Or in Cape Town. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Ciao. Okay, bye. Bye. The other conference.